Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is David Baumgold. The name in the printed handout was a mistake. So this is the real guy. And um, we're going to learn about Flask. Take it away. Thank you. So hi, my name is David Baumgold. I'm a freelance web developer in the Boston area, and I've been building APIs in Flask for a long time. Wanted to share some of the basics of what I know. So I assume that if you're here, you already know more or less what an API is, and you know why they're really cool. They allow different companies and different people to mash up different pieces of information together and build some really cool results out of the, out of the, the blend. And they're so hot right now. So given all that, let's learn how to build an API. Oh, except your boss has told you that you only have about a week to spend on this, and you have to start from zero and figure out how to do everything. So great, we'll build one really, really fast. It'll be awesome. It'll be fantastic. So before we get started, let's define what we actually want to build and what we care about. Um, so for a very simple prototype API, I'd say probably the things we care about the most are a JSON data format, because that's what all the cool kids are using these days, uh, CRUD operations, which is create, read, update, and delete for those of you who are not database weenies, REST semantics, which is a structure of an API that allows you to treat individual objects as resources and do operations onto them. And probably the most important thing is that we want our API to be very flexible, because we don't quite know what we want yet. We want to play around and have our code be able to respond easily and quickly. And although there are many things we do care about, there are a couple of things I want to say we don't care about in this presentation. We don't care about stability and testing. We don't care about long-term maintainability or edge cases. And we certainly don't care about operations and deployment, because this is only a prototype. The goal of this is about flexibility of coding, not about building something that is stable and maintainable over a long period. That is a different talk. So let's get started. So my favorite tool for building web applications and APIs is Flask, because it has a really shallow learning curve and it's easy to get started. So let's actually start with the Hello World example that you can find on the Flask website. Short and sweet, and when you visit it in the browser, you get a Hello World. Now, the first step is to modify this to get some JSON information. So Flask actually has a built-in function called JSONify. And if you pass data to that JSONify function, it'll return it as a JSON formatted piece of information. So basically, what we have here right now is we have our very first API. It's read-only. It just returns the string, hello world. But it's something. But it's not really what we want to get to. So let's think of some idea that we can put into our API that makes it a little bit more compelling. And I don't know about you, but I love puppies. <laughs> they're super cute, and there are way too many kitties on the internet and not enough puppies. So we're going to build a puppy API, and it's going to be fantastic. So here is our basic puppy API. It's going to return some information about Rover. We've got his name, and we've got a URL where the user can visit to get a picture of Rover. And as we've seen, he's very cute. So, Here's our basic API, but again, it's not really as much as we're looking for, because this is an API that only returns information about one specific puppy. And there are lots of puppies in the world, and we want to hug all of them. <laughs> so now we have a data structure that's going to define multiple puppies in our code base. This is a list of puppies that has two entries in it. And we've changed the URL route as well, so that now when you visit this API, you have to specify an index into this list. You're actually going to visit you know, puppyapi.com slash one, or puppyapi.com slash 15, or whatever. And it's going to index into that list and try to find the puppy and, and put that out using the JSONify method. And if it can't find it, it's going to return a 404 exception. Not found, which is what we expect. And now if you visit this in the browser, you'll get something like this. Go to slash zero, and you've got rover. Go to slash one, you've got spot. And if you go to slash two, then, well, there's no puppies there. Sorry. But 0, 1, and 2 aren't really very friendly URLs either. You know, we want to hug these puppies, not count them. So we can modify this pretty easily to say, instead of a list of puppies, we're going to have a dictionary of puppies. And what I have for the keys of this dictionary is something that's called a slug. And that is actually a publishing term. I'm not sure where the term slug itself comes from, but all it means is it's a short, usually lowercase, ASCII letter version of whatever object you're trying to find. And that allows you to uniquely identify a specific object while also having a human-friendly name. 
And we've had to change very little in our method as well to make it so that you can look up puppies by slug instead of by number. Basically, all we've had to do is specify that slug can be a string instead of an integer, and it's a look, check for a key error instead of an index error. And now you can go to slash rover and get information about rover. You can go to slash spot and get information about spot. And if you're looking for Lassie, well, sorry, she's rescuing Timmy on the well again. Poor Timmy. So end of day one, and the result is it works. We have a working JSON API. But the bad news is it's still not enough. All we have is static data. And if you want to modify the puppies that are available in this API, you actually have to go into the code base and rewrite it. So let's start day two with adding another piece of complexity to our code base. We're going to use another Flask extension, and this one is called Flask SQL Alchemy. Now, the general idea of what we're doing is we want to separate our concerns. We want to have the Python code operate on the views. We want to have the data outside of the Python code and put that into a database. Databases are great for holding data. That's what they're built for. And it also allows you to modify the data that this API can represent without modifying the Python code. So to do that, we're going to use SQL Alchemy, which is an object relational mapper. Briefly, what an object relational mapper does, it allows you to query and update data in a database without having to write straight SQL, but instead it allows you to treat it in a more Python Pythonic fashion. So let me give you an update, uh, an example of what I mean. Here is a model that we're going to use for our puppy API. As you can see, we're just importing something from the Flask SQL Alchemy module, we're initializing it, and then we're creating our puppy class, which is a subclass of model. And this class has four pieces of information attached to it. It has a numerical ID, which is used by the database to keep track of which puppy is which. It has a slug, which is a more human-friendly way of doing the same thing. And it has a name and an image URL, which we're familiar with. There are a couple of other things I want to call out here. So I've added an index equals true attribute on the slug field so that the database will index this field and allow us to look up puppies very quickly by specifying a slug. And I've also specified that the name and the image URL are not optional, that in order to create a puppy, you have to have a name and you have to have an image URL, which prevents us from having puppies that are nameless and unloved. So I'm also going to go over very, very briefly how to use SQL Alchemy. Briefly, you want to create a puppy object and add it to your database session. You can add multiple puppy objects to that session. And then when you're ready, you can call session.commit which will actually take those objects and save them to the database permanently. Once you've done that, then you can query the database and get that data back out on the same request or on subsequent API requests as well. So you can do puppy.query.all, and that will return to a list of all the puppies that exist in the database. You can also filter down on that query and specify limitations on which puppies should be returned. And then you can call dot first to get, instead of a list of all the results, you can just get the first result. So now we're getting only spot from the database, even though both spot and rover are in there. You can also use the dot filter by method as sort of a shortcut so that you don't have to specify exactly which slug you're referring to if it's very clear from the, from the query itself that you're only dealing with one model. And if you don't get any matches in your query, it's just going to return a none object which sort of makes sense in a Pythonic way. You can also update a database by getting a puppy object, modifying attributes on that object, and then passing it back into the database session and committing that session. Once you query this, the database again, it'll be updated. And you can also delete from the database by calling db.session.delete on a model object. So basically, this allows you to do all of your standard database operations without leaving the comfort and familiarity of Python. And there's a lot more that you can do with SQL Alchemy, but I don't want to go too deep into it in this talk because, again, that is its own separate talk. So if you want to learn more, you can check out the documentation. So we've already defined the model for our puppy object. Uh, I did that a couple of slides ago. So here we're going to integrate that model into the view that we already had. I'm just importing it. I'm setting up a little bit of configuration to say that we want to use a SQLite database. You can use MySQL or Postgres or Oracle or many different options that SQL Alchemy supports. And then we rewrite our get puppy view just a little bit so that it does a database query instead of pulling out from the dictionary that used to be in the code. Now, another thing I wanted to call out is this first or 404 method. And that's something that's added by Flask SQL Alchemy. That's like the integration layer between the two of them. And that's a really nice shortcut that says 
get the first item that this query returns, and if you can't find it, then just return a 404 exception. So we do that and we try to run it and we get an internal server error. What went wrong? Turns out that you have to actually initialize the database before you can actually use the database. You have to tell the database what structure the data should be in. And for that, you can use the db.createAll method. So I've just added something to the section at the end where I can run this code and say create the database and it'll contact my SQLite file and create the structure. And if I try to run it again, well, now we get a 404. And that's because we need to seed data into the database before we can pull it out in the views as well. So you can't query the database if there's nothing in there to query. Now, if I were doing this in a more production-ready manner, I would probably have separate scripts for this. Like in Django, you can use manage.py. And in Flask, you can use something very similar using Flask script or using the very recently released Flask 0.11. You can actually define scripts using the click integration framework. But I'm not going into that because, again, this is just a prototype. Anyway, once you've done all these things, we have exactly the same results as we had before. We can go to slash rover and get rover. We can go to slash spot and get spot. And Lassie is still conspicuously missing. However, now that we have an actual database, we can do some more interesting features. So here's a method to not just view information in the database, but actually create new information. I have a create puppy method. And what this will do is it'll get information from the incoming HTTP request. It'll validate it and make sure that the puppy has a name and an image URL. And if it does, it'll create it in the database and return an HTTP, an HTTP response indicating that the puppy was successfully created. It'll also find the URL to where you can find more information about that puppy and return that. All of this is using variables that we've seen before except for a few. So request and URL for are things that are built into Flask. And Slugify is a third-party module that I've installed which just allows me to take a normal name and convert it into a short, lowercase, standard, slugified version of it. So now, if you try to use this method, you can use curl to generate a post request. And the end result is you're going to get a response that looks exactly how we, expect, how we expect it to for a JSON RESTful API. We get a 201 created response, and we get this really nice location header, which is standard in the HTTP uh, definitions as well to indicate if you want to learn more about this object you've just created, you can request it at this URL. So great, now we have dynamic data. But the bad news is our code is still kind of verbose, and the views are reaching into the models, which means that our data isn't as well separated as we'd like. This is an example of what I mean by reaching into the models. We've defined the database structure in our models, but in the view, it still needs to know which attributes of the model to pull out into JSON. So we're going to add a little bit more complexity for the sake of flexibility. And we're going to add a new module called Flask Marshmallow. Now what Flask Marshmallow does is it's a data transformer. It allows you to convert between an internal representation of a resource and an external representation of a resource. So the database holds the data. The Marshmallow transforms from the internal data to what we want to view in the API. And Flask only has to take that data and render it in JSON. So here's an example of a schema that we're using. It's pretty simple because Marshmallow actually has great support both for Flask and for SQL Alchemy. So we can say we're going to make a puppy schema, and the model that it should use is the same puppy model that we defined before, and that's all we need to say. And then we can create instances of a puppy schema, both for an individual puppy and for a list of puppies, which will be important if you want to have an API method that returns a list of puppies. So now that we have this schema, our views become even simpler than they were before. So you can import the schema, and you can set up Marshmallow with a Flask application, and now our get, our get puppy method becomes just two lines long of Python. The first line is doing a database query to get the internal representation of a puppy object. And the second line is transforming that internal representation into what we want to display on the output. Now, because we haven't told Marshmallow anything about how that should display, it's just going to display everything, including the ID and the slug, which we haven't really cared about in the past. So let's go back to how we used to be. All we have to do is tell Marshmallow, hey, the internal and the external representation are slightly different in that the external representation doesn't include an ID or a slug. 
And that simple change will change it so that when you output a puppy, it'll only have the image URL and the name. And that's gonna give us more flexibility down the line, as I'll mention as well later on. In order to create a puppy, this becomes dramatically simpler as well, because now that we have a schema that defines how the representation, how the representation should be in JSON, we can simply load it from the, U from the variables that are passed in the HTTP request. And Marshmallow will take care of all the data validation for us. So we can check and see if there were any errors, and if so, just output them. We also can add new methods for editing and deleting puppies. And editing is super similar. It's almost exactly the same as creating. All we have to do is that first line, we're checking to see if the puppy already exists in the database. And if it does, then we're just going to pass it to the second line as an instance. And now Marshmallow knows that instead of creating a new puppy object, it should update the values that it's already found on that instance. And just for clarity for the user who's using this API, we've also modified the response message to say that it's been updated instead of created. And to delete a puppy, we're just going to say we're gonna take a delete HTTP verb, and we're going to find that, that puppy in the database, and we're going to pass it to db.session.delete. Super easy. And here's an example of using that delete method. You can see the first time that I do it, I get that nice friendly JSON message saying that the puppy was deleted. And the second time, I'm gonna get this sort of unfriendly 404 error, so let's change that. Flask actually has integrated error handlers so that you can say, if you get a 404 exception, this is how it should look instead of the default. And now, if I try to delete a puppy that isn't there, I'm going to get a JSONified error message, which is great for prototyping an API. We can also make a simple view to list all the puppies in the database as well. And that's super easy as well. Just get all the puppies in the database and dump them out. And you can see each individual puppy is going to be output the same way that that schema has already defined. And because we're using Marshmallow, we get data flexibility, which is fantastic. We can add new fields to our models, and they'll be instantly and automatically represented in our data output. Because we've told Marshmallow, just output everything except those two fields we don't care about. So if I add an age field, it's already there in the API. Super fast, super easy. And as I mentioned, we get full data validation automatically for free. So if you try to create a puppy without specifying any information, it'll tell you all of the things that you need and it'll tell you the data types as well if you get them wrong. So previously we were checking them one at a time and if any of them were missing, we would just throw an error and say, you need this. And then if the user provided it, we would also say, oh, you also need that. With Marshmallow, you can get all the errors up front, so it's much easier to use the API. So great, we have flexibility and we have validation. The bad news is the boss has come back and said, actually, it's not enough. We also need API users so that we can track who's using our API and why. So now we're gonna integrate with another piece of Flask extension called Flask Login, and this is used for handling user support. So the real question here is when you're talking about an API, how do you determine who the active user is? Because with a normal API request, you don't really get any information about who's who. So the standard way of doing this is to provide some sort of information in the API request to identify who it is that's making that request. And you can do that with an authorized header or however you'd like. So what I'm doing here is I'm making a new model in my SQL Alchemy database, just a user model. The user has an ID and a name, and it also has an API key, which will be used to look up which key references which user. And then I'm using Flask login to set up a request, uh, uh, sorry, a login manager, and when a request comes in, it's going to automatically load the user from the authorization header if that user exists. So the nice thing about this is once we've set up Flask login in this way, we can use some of the nice utilities that it provides as well, such as there's a current user pointer. So I've created a new route here that is just who am I, and if you access this route, it'll tell you who you are or if you're an anonymous user. And I've just created this Jack London user in my database for simplicity. You can also use login required and other decorators provided by this module. So if there are certain APIs that are sensitive, that you only want to be accessible by certain users or only by logged in users in general rather than anonymous users, you can just apply the simple decorator. And if you try to access that API without providing an authorization header, it'll give you a 401 unauthorized exception except that this is also sort of an ugly exception because it's, HTD, because it's HTML instead of JSON. So we can do exactly the same thing as we did before. 
to convert that HTML exception into a JSON one. Just show that it's an unauthorized error instead of a not found error. It's the same basic idea. Flask is pretty consistent. And I'd love to go on and tell you more about some of the awesome things you can do with Flask, such as pagination, rate limiting, and even doing documentation for your API using Flask API spec. But unfortunately, I'm about out of time. So there's lots more that you can do with Flask. There's a whole ecosystem out there. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So we actually have about 10 minutes for questions. If you would hold your hand up so that I could bring you the microphone, that way the recordings will capture it. So we, we have, ah, here we go. Hey, <clears throat> hey, probably a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want, over here. Ah, thank you. <laughs> if you, uh, with Flask Marshmallow, if you have um, different fields you want to return, if it's a list versus if it's one uh, item from the list, is that supported natively in there? So uh, with the Marshmallow schema that I was using, you can specify multiple equals true when initializing your schema, and then it'll know that you're intending to return a multiple a, a list of multiple objects instead of just a single one. Uh, so related to Flask Marshmallow, if you ever have a relational database between, you know, your RM stuff, can it handle that? Can you return data from multiple different tables if there's a relation between them? So Flask SQL Alchemy natively supports working with multiple databases. So you don't even have to have that as a layer in between SQL Alchemy and Marshmallow. You can actually set that up in your SQL Alchemy model, models itself. As I said, SQL Alchemy is an incredibly powerful and incredibly useful tool, and there's lots of great documentation on how to use it well. So that's what I would recommend. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, have you considered using Flask RESTful, or have you used it in the past, and what are your thoughts on it? I have used Flask RESTful in the past, and it's been a useful tool. However, the problems I've had with it is that it's not as good at handling the intermediate representations between internal data and external data. And I find that the way that you have to define your RESTful outputs, for whatever reason, it doesn't really work with the way that, I, that my head thinks. I prefer being able to define each individual route by itself. There's also, I believe, um, the same author of Marshmallow has written a couple of other pieces to work with it as well. I think it was originally called Flask S'more because it was an extension of Marshmallow, which does the same sort of thing that Flask RESTful does, but I'll be honest, I've never used it. So I don't really have a very good answer to that question aside from I've used RESTful in the past. It was fine, but it, it's not as nice as these things that I've demoed here in my opinion. Okay, anything else? No, I think we're done. Thanks, David, that was great. Thank you.